We traveled to Krasnovodsk by train, straight to the port. Before we were loaded onto the ship, we were given some soup to eat. The soup was made from very salty dried fish and was very salty. Everybody was so hungry that we ate the salty soup. There was no other choice, so we ate it. Then, just before we boarded the ship, we were also given a dry piece of black bread and two salty herrings straight out of a barrel. The ship, it was an oil tanker, not a passenger ship. It was a tanker. On the upper deck were maybe four or five thousand people crowded together, one standing next to the other. I remember that there was such beautiful weather that day. Everybody was in a kind of ecstasy, that we were eventually going to be free, and that we were escaping this Russian hell. We set sail around two o'clock in the afternoon. The ship rocked slightly, but the sea was very calm then. It only really rocked when a kind of a long wave would come. It was not visible yet, but people were starting to feel it. Later the fog grew thick and the storm began. People were seasick. It turned out that there was no water to drink on the ship. People were extremely thirsty after all of that salty fish soup and those salty herrings. There was no water to drink, and this was a tragedy. And there was a terrible storm on the Caspian Sea. Our ship was literally thrown back and forth. Seawater covered us. It poured over us all the time because we were out in the open on the upper deck. A lot of people were washed out to the sea and nobody even noticed or acknowledged it. Nobody. Who knows how many died during the storm. I was also almost washed away, I remember. Everyone was so seasick. Once, when the ship inclined and a big wave came, I almost got washed away. But at the last moment, I grabbed a kind of a barrier and held on to it. Unfortunately, the ship suffered additional damage at night. During the storm, I think the rudder was broken or something like that. Because of this, we sailed for three days and three nights on the Caspian Sea without water, without food, without anything. During the day, the sun was strong. There were no shadows to hide in on the deck. We were in the sun all day, every day. It was hot. By the third day, it made no difference to us. We were in a state of mind where we didn't care whether the ship capsized or not. We were so exhausted. We even tried drinking the seawater, but that made things even worse. We stayed on the ship until the fourth day, when another ship appeared and they loaded us onto it, in the middle of the sea. We got to Pailevi in Iran on April 1st, 1942. We got off the ship at Port Pailevi and traveled a few miles to our camp. The camp was built by the British on the shore of the Caspian Sea. But in order to get there, first we had to walk through the city. We saw those shops full of fruits, full of all kinds of food. We were shaking. Our legs were trembling. Our knees were trembling when we saw it because we were so hungry and exhausted. We got to our camp and immediately we had to take off our clothes. All of the uniforms we had been given in Russia, in Lugovaya, we had to take them off and burn them immediately. Disinfection, bathing. And from that moment on, a new, different life started for us. A totally different life. We had some money. We could even buy food. The Iranians near the camp were selling eggs, fish, and different kinds of food. But a lot of people paid for it with their lives because their bodies were not used to food this rich in proteins and nutrients. A lot of people got sick from eating it after years of constant hunger. But later, I was in the camp on the beach maybe a week, maybe ten days, when I met my sister. She had been looking for me in every evacuee transport from Russia. This is how she learned that I had arrived in Pailevi. Really, it was a terrific moment. We had parted in Chelyabinsk. All this time we hadn't heard any news about one another. I learned from her that she had been sent to the south of Russia, maybe in Yangiul or somewhere near there. And there she had joined the Polish army. And from there she had evacuated with the army 
and then we met in Iran. But very quickly, we were parted again. The transports were formed. We were sent off further. First through the Iranian mountains. They were very beautiful. But the transport was made up of trucks driven by Iranians who drove like madmen on those mountain roads. Our hair stood on end, turning those serpentine curves at such speeds. They drove with such bravery. But accidents happened. Some of the trucks full of people went down and everyone was killed. Yes, there were accidents like that. So we were transported to Iraq, to the west of Baghdad, maybe 30 miles into the desert near the Lake Habaniya. The British built a dam on one of the branches of the Euphrates. And literally, there in the desert, where there wasn't any source of water, blade or grass or bush, there was a lake in the desert. They also built an army camp next to this lake, and we spent three or four weeks there. It was April already, so it was so hot, very hot. Even the lake water was warm, not cold. But we began to resume a normal life in this camp. There was nutritious food. We had regular army days with drills. But the attitude of our cadre, officers, and all of the professional soldiers toward us, towards the soldiers, toward all of us who were volunteers, changed for the better. There was a strong British influence, so it wasn't anything like the camp in Russia, in Lugovaya, that I described earlier. Here things changed for the better. From there, from Habania, we traveled on trucks again, seven days through the desert, through Iraq and Jordania to Palestine. I remember the exact date, May 1st, 1942. We crossed the Palestinian border in a convoy of army trucks. During our trip, we stayed overnight in the desert. There were, you wouldn't call them camps, just places where the convoy stopped. There was water, tanks with water, and a small kitchen. And mostly we slept on the sand, but there were a lot of scorpions, a lot of insects, a lot of different spiders, black widows, tarantulas. It was a nightmare for us to sleep in that desert. From there, we arrived at Palestine. I remember that Jewish women greeted us. There were Jewish settlements there at the time, kibbutzes, something like cooperative farms. We drove in columns. The Jewish women stood next to the road and tossed oranges to us. It was spring, their season for oranges. It was so nice, but the trucks were traveling at 50 miles per hour, and all the oranges they tossed were crushed. But it was so different, so sweet and nice of them. Different people, nice people. They were dressed well. They looked good, well nourished. There was no sight of the sort of poverty there had been in Russia. In Palestine, I was... All of our regiment was assigned to an anti-aircraft division when the 10th Division was formed. So I was assigned to anti-aircraft. Later I noticed that they had assigned all of the youngsters whom they didn't know what to do with to anti-aircraft. Also some older people too. There were a lot of professors and teachers there too. It was a very interesting section. In Palestine, I was in a camp called Bay Jirja, north of the Gaza. At the same time, the Polish Independent Carpathian Rifle Brigade from Livia, from Tobruk, arrived, and the 3rd Division was formed. On precisely May 3, 1942, the 3rd Carpathian Rifle Division was officially formed.